Metaphysics has always been drawn to one of two approaches. There are those who strive to give a single encompassing account of all reality on the basis of a single method, set of principles. Think about Aristotle for whom all first philosophy appeals to the single principle of primary substance and to a single unmoved mover as the primary, primary substance. And then there are those who embrace plurality and argue that an account of the whole of things must make appeal to a plurality of complementary principles and approaches. Again, think about Aristotle, who typically approaches philosophical problems by saying men on the one hand, de on the other. The philosophy of Larry Cahoon is very much in the men de mode. We've seen this throughout his illustrious career from the time that he spent teaching Boston University to his present time at Holy Cross College. Uh, he's, we see this already in his dissertation, The Dynamics of Subjectivism, a Philosophy of Modernity at Stony Brook University, directed by Edward Casey. In the volume titles that we see, The Ends of Philosophy, Pragmatism, Foundationalism, and Postmodernism, Civil Society, the Conservative Meaning of Liberal Politics, Cultural Revolutions, Reason versus Culture in Philosophy, Politics, and Jihad, and the Dilemma of Modernity, Philosophy, Culture, and Anti-Culture, and the 2015 John Finley Award in Metaphysics uh, for uh, uh, the volume, The Orders of Nature. Uh, you, we can also see this in uh, the... Uh, video series for the great courses, uh, modern intellectual tradition from Descartes to Derrida and modern political tradition from Hobbes to Habermas. And incidentally, uh, it's because of these videos that I think that Larry has the uh, unique distinction among uh, those present in our meeting this year of being extensively bootlegged on uh, YouTube. So you folks should check out those lectures. They're quite good. He's also the author of uh, Wise Guys, a philosophical comedy uh, made available through Heartland Plays. Like all great metaphysicians, Larry has his eye on the whole. His general approach is, however, pluralistic. Reality is complex and no single method or set of principles can suffice. Yet we don't leave it at that. The orders of reality cohere and the way in which they cohere can itself be studied. Just as in his political writings, where Larry has argued that liberal and conservative theory are incomplete without one another, so in regard to metaphysics, he is an exemplar of our discipline, showing how various approaches need one another. He is a pluralist cultivating a dialogue among the parts. And so he is an especially fitting uh, president for our society, which both has its eye on the whole and retains its open-minded pluralism. Uh, it's a very, very great honor and pleasure to introduce our president this year, Lawrence Cahoon, professor of philosophy at Holy Cross University, who will be delivering this year's presidential address towards an ordinal naturalism. So, I, Larry. Thank you, Owen, from your lips to God's ears. Um, what you're seeing now is a uh, cartoon by the physicist Sidney Harris that kind of uh, expresses some of the feelings behind this paper. Um, I'll uh, read my paper with the PowerPoint presentation, and uh, I will only turn the chat on. I'll be handling my own questions. So I'll only turn the chat on when I'm done talking, and then I'll take all the questions. <clears throat> it has been four decades since the 1970s when Ernan McMullen, Marjorie Green, and John Compton gave presidential addresses to the Metaphysical Society on nature and the relation of natural science to metaphysics. A reprise may be in order. What follows is a version of non-reductive naturalism that makes use, full use of the natural sciences. John Herman Randall distinguished three conceptions of metaphysics. 
the search for the principles of being with respect to which all things are one, the search for the real in opposition to appearances, and the search for the generic traits of and relations among all subject matters. For the last, metaphysics differs from other inquiries only in its generality. My essay follows that approach. It's dedicated to Morris Cohen, teacher of Paul Weiss, our society's founder. Had I time, I would present my argument this way. To argue for naturalism or any metaphysical view, we need to be able to first talk about things in the broadest sense in a language which does not presume the view we argue for. One plausible approach is to use a pluralistic language deliberately indeterminate with respect to most, not all, metaphysical issues. I suggest the most pluralistic language available is a little known product of the American philosophical tradition called objective relativism. Given objective relativism, we can then argue that a certain kind of naturalism is best able to account for whatever has been discriminated by the former. The naturalism in question must accept emergence as a phenomenon in nature. Such a naturalism, based in objective relativism and emergence, can then robustly incorporate plausible understandings of the physical, biological, mental, and cultural systems and processes of reality, hence accept evidence from sources as different as natural science, logic, phenomenology, pragmatism, and cultural studies without claiming completeness or certitude. Altogether, I call this view ordinal naturalism, a term borrowed from Beth Singer. What follows has three parts. The first two, the first presents two hypotheses, objective relativism and fallibilism to create a least determinate language for discussing things, performing the role of what some might call an ontology, albeit without an account of being per se. The second part presents two hypotheses which define a metaphysics of emergent naturalism. The final part hypothesizes a more determinate set of concepts for the analysis of a pluralistic naturalism, a cosmology, if you will, which coheres with the former. Together, they constitute ordinal naturalism. Now, objective relativism needs some historical explanation. It grew out of the explosion of realism in 20th century North Atlantic philosophy. Among thinkers influenced, particularly among thinkers influenced by Charles Peirce and William James. Cohen explored it avant la lettre during the First World War. It was in effect a pluralist version of the doctrine called neutral monism adopted by James and Bertrand Russell. Arthur Murphy named it in 1927. Mead and his student Charles Morris adopted objective relativism. It became part of the mid-century Columbia naturalism of Randall, Ernest Nagel, Justice Buckler, and Thomas Robichon. Morris called objective relativism the proper metaphysics for pragmatism. Nagel used it as one name for America's, quote, most important contradu contribution to philosophical intelligence, unquote. Eventually, Buckler constructed its most complete formulation. Its proponents all considered it a kind of naturalism. I will disagree. My first hypothesis is a reconstruction of the core of objective naturalism, of relativism. First, whatever has been or can be discriminated is a something which functions or obtains in some sets of relations, hence contexts, and which is itself a context for other somethings. There's nothing special about the term a something. We could use a thing, an item, or more elegantly, a complex the short form of Cohen's term, a complex of things in relation. It applies not merely to entities, but to events, possibilities, properties, processes, acts, relations, universals, values, etc. The term a complex is itself a complex. Our practical criterion for being a complex is discriminability. That does not mean complexes are the product of our discrimination. Discriminable, 
is just the broadest term for whatever is recognizable, distinguishable, thinkable, or perceivable as one complex and not others. Our practical guide to what is discriminable is what has been discriminated in the past. Objective relativism is a distributive rather than collective approach to things, separately suggested by James, Cohen, and Randall. It provides a language for describing each, not all. It does not characterize beings collectively or present an exhaustive list of types of being. Any complex X functions in relation to other complexes Y, which may serve as a context or order for X. Likewise, X functions as the context or order for its own properties and or parts Z. The same holds true of Y and Z. A baseball game is a complex, but so is each player and each pitch, as well as the city and the culture in which it occurs. This is not an attempt at what is sometimes called a view from nowhere, nor a view from everywhere, but rather a view from anywhere. Objective relativism accepts the view that Buckler labeled ontological parity. As Cohen and Randall separately put it, the question is not, is something real? But how is it real? In what context does it function? There are no degrees of reality or existence among complexes. Ontologically, the opposite of real or existent must be unreal or non-existent. And it makes no sense to deny reality or existence to anything that we must account for. Note this does not apply to the term actuality whose antonyms include possibility in the past. That something is more independent or causal or more important than something else does not mean it is more real or existent. The real versus unreal distinction is here captured by distinguishing the orders in which something functions. The unicorn is as real as the horse, one in the context of literature, the other in the context of biology. Now, objective relativism has a heterodox corollary. Because it makes no use of terms which imply that the analysis of any complex ends or a reference character is unaffected by what is outside itself, it abjures reference to simples, foundations, a highest reality, the whole or the one. As Nagel put it, quote, Every, while every quality and event is a genuine occurrence in some process or context, no one context is relevant to the occurrence of everything, unquote. But I will return to this and modify it. The second hypothesis was, I claim, implicit among the objective relativists. Our knowledge of any... the. This is uh, statement two. Our knowledge of any complex is never certain or complete. This is just Peirce's fallibilism. All the objective relativists were influenced by Peirce. He insisted we have knowledge of objects as they are independent of our knowing, but such knowledge is never complete or certain. We never have adequate reason to say there is nothing more to know about anything. And we cannot know that the more will not recast the context in which the known is located. Recontextualization does not disqualify prior knowledge. The fact that Einstein was more right does not mean Newton knew nothing. And fallibilism too is fallible. The denial of certainty is not certain, but there being no pragmatic difference between accepting a belief due to high likelihood and due to certainty no truth is lost. Fallibilism has a crucial cap corollary. It denies that the validity of knowledge in a given context is necessarily dependent on the validity of knowledge of more basic or inclusive contexts, hence transitively dependent on the most fundamental or most inclusive. For fallibilism, we cannot hold our local knowledge hostage to knowledge of the first or the last, the foundation or the whole. As Peirce wrote, quote, 
Philosophy ought to trust the multitude and variety of, it, of its arguments rather than the conclusiveness of any one. Its reasoning should not form a chain which is no stronger than its weakest link, but a cable whose fibers may be ever so slender, provided that they are sufficiently numerous and intimately connected, unquote. Contemporary philosopher of science, William Wimsatt calls this robustness, a robust claim being one for which we have multiple independent sources of evidence, argument, or experience. After all, any judgment about fundamental or comprehensive contexts would have to be tested against our judgments of the more local and robust. Now, before proceeding, we must deal with some objections, not definitively, but plausibly. Among the problems one might raise against objective relativism, three are prominent. First, some will object that to drop the whole or the one from consideration is a deflation or even a renunciation of the entire task of metaphysics. The objective relativists did indeed deny that the whole or one could be a discriminable something. But fallibilism helps to clarify this. For fallibilism, the whole or any non-contextual first or last term of analysis is indeed unnecessary for the metaphysical intelligibility of what we discriminate, but it is not forbidden. The term everything in its collective sense is intelligible. We can always make inferences from any sample to any population containing it, but the character inferred to such a population must be probabilistic. In the case of everything, that population would include indefinitely many unknown orders. Any hypothesis regarding its character, while legitimate, must be highly tentative. What fallibilism cannot abide is using any such hypothesis about everything to deny the validity of apparently robust local knowledge that is inconsistent with it. The global is known to the degree that it is known through the local. Second, while the objective relativists always claim to be realists, Bertrand Russell and Arthur Lovejoy separately raised an objection. Suppose X is something that functions in relations to two different orders, R to Y and R to Z and exhibits at least some different properties in each case. If X's identity is not independent of XRY or XRZ, then that seems to imply that the X of XRY and the X of XRZ must be two different Xs. Or in effect that RY and RZ change X into a new complex, not X. And if Y and Z are, for example, the perceptions of two agents, Yael and Zachary, that implies that perception changes the perceived. The first two points would do metaphysical, the third perceptual realism. How can X be identifiable and re-identifiable as X while owning non-identical XRY and XRZ each of which is another complex, as it would be for objective relativism. All that is required is to distinguish identity from integrity and to hold that to identify a complex is to ascribe it an identity potentially functioning in multiple contextual integrities. This was Buckler's revision of objective relativism. An integrity of X is what X is in some relation, its function in some order. X is a something with an identity which includes relations to other somethings, hence alternate integrities. Xavion is an individual who can become brother to Yael and friend to Zachary, all while remaining Xavion, however much those relations may alter him. As Cohen had argued, the relation between essential and accidental properties or between internal and external relations is itself relational or context dependent. This means some properties of XRY may be essential to X's identity in all contexts, while others are not. 
But what then is the criterion for X's identity? What is the line between a new integrity of X and something that is not X? I claim this is a question for the methodology of the local subject matter, not ontology or metaphysics. There is no reason to believe that the identity conditions for light waves, gods, properties, moments, bacteria, possibilities, plants, and artworks should be the same. There remains another problem. Objective relativism seems incompatible with our usual, usual notions of naturalism, especially when incorporating the natural sciences. Let's take an example. For the objective relativist, the train tracks are parallel and convergent, parallel in relation to material structure, convergent in the visual experience of a binocular in, animal standing on them. Each is a contextual integrity of the tracks. Neither has priority. And there is no contradiction as long as contexts are specified. That's objective relativism. But as we will see, this is inadequate for any contemporary naturalism. Cohen, Morris, Randall, Nagel, and even Buckler regarded objective relativism as naturalistic, but it is not. It is pluralistic. Objective relativism is too thin an account to be naturalistic. A viable naturalism must regard the parallelism, parallelism of the train tracks as prior to their convergence in some respects. But why then base a naturalistic metaphysics on an objective relativism that has this problem? For three reasons. First, to argue for, rather than merely assume naturalism, one must claim that it best captures what is discriminable by a less determinant language. Objective relativism provides that. Second, objective relativism denies that the reality, identity, or causal significance of a complex hinges on its independence of relations to other complexes, there being no such thing. We will see that this has a conceptually valuable impact on the naturalism resulting from it. Third, <clears throat> naturalism conceived through objective relativism drops what I claim are unjustifiable claims like, quote, nature is everything, or, quote, everything is natural, or, quote, all discriminables must be in nature, as well as physicalist formulations like everything is physical or everything is based in or realized by the physical. All such claims about the foundation or collective whole of nature are disqualified in advance by objective relativism. But wait, isn't that a vice, not a virtue? How can any modern naturalism, cognizant of 400 years of a modern natural science, whose global validity can hardly be denied, Exclude claims that nature is everything or all is physical or all is realized in or based in the physical or that the physical sciences are the privileged knowledge of nature. By defining naturalism in the following way, my point three. Naturalism claims that whatever is discriminated functions in one temporal enduring ensemble of complexes called nature where no set of members is causally isolated from all others, and in which some natural kinds, like the objects of the human sciences, asymmetrically depend on other kinds, like the objects of the natural sciences. That is, nature is an ensemble of orders in which complexes function, where no set of members is causally isolated from all others. This merely excludes from naturalism certain forms of metaphysical dualism, and supranaturalism. Uh, the complexes of such a nature are now natural complexes. Second, modern science recognizes the nomological fact that among the complexes functioning in nature, some kinds asymmetrically depend on others. We have strong evidence that there is chemistry without life, but no life without chemistry. Minds appear to require neurology and cultural meanings 
depend on rare linguistic animals. These dependencies are a posteriori facts about the natural orders we discriminate. Third and last, this means the natural sciences do have a priority over the other sciences, but it is a limited priority. And as we will see, it is not epistemic. So this is number three, is the naturalism that we can define in the language of objective relativism. Now, crucially, this kind of naturalism is emergent. There's a substantial literature on emergence. Suffice to say that what follows is a strong form of emergence, but one rooted in scientific explanatory practices. In ordinary language and in science, we commonly explain the dent in the fender by the impact of the other car. This is, an, this is explanation by means of comparably scaled systems and their properties. But sometimes we find a more useful explanation at the scale of the car's components, like the density of the materials in the fender. Such reductive explanation derives a system property from the properties of the system's parts and their interaction rules. Alternately, we sometimes employ a functional explanation which describes a system's property from its role in an encompassing system's activity or structure. In this case, local traffic patterns. Emergence is first of all the claim that the systemic and functional explanations are not entirely replaceable by reductive explanations. Some properties of some systems require non-reductive explanation because they are characterized by, as Wimsat puts it, non-aggregative properties. In such cases, the organization of the system has shaped what the parts contribute to the whole. The crucial point is that the three forms of explanation are not incompatible. Some properties of a system or event can be explained reductively, while others must be explained systemically or functionally. My mass is indeed the aggregate of the masses of my components at each level of description, my tissues, my organ systems, my cells, my molecules, my atoms. But any interesting properties of my liver, my metabolism, or my reflex actions cannot be explained or even defined in terms of molecules and atoms and their interaction rules. If you roll me down an inclined plane, physics can explain my velocity, but neither my vomiting nor my cursing. As physicist Laszlo Tiza famously remarked, while the physicist can predict, predict the trajectory of a planet, only the biologist can predict that the hen's egg will hatch a chick. Emergence and reduction are compatible because they are matters of degree. If successful explanation is a key to what obtains in the world, then explanatory emergence gives credence to metaphysical emergence. For there appear to be levels or strata of natural complexes where things similar in size and dynamic properties largely interact with each other, yielding systems that are multiply realizable in their lower level components and processes. Some of these strata are different enough to be the objects of distinct sciences. Referring to Wimsat again, he, as he puts it, quote, levels of organization are a deep, non-arbitrary and extremely important feature of the ontological architecture of our natural world, and almost certainly of any world that can produce or be inhabited and understood by intelligent beings. Thus my fourth hypothesis, some of the natural complexes which asymmetrically depend on others exhibit emergent properties, and some of those pro properties exert downward causation on the kinds of complexes on which they depend. Thus, in the nature we know, other identifiable strata directly or, independent or indirectly depend on the physical, understood as the objects of physics. That is true. The dependence on physics is widespread among the other orders I'll mention. But acknowledging that does not endorse physicalism or grant epistemic superiority to physical explanation. As fallibilists, we presume the prima facie approximate but fallible validity of all contemporary sciences in the broad sense of the German term 
all Wissenschaften, regarding their objects. Both human and natural science studies are due this respect. But naturalism must grant one limited priority to the natural sciences. The objects of the human sciences are one species and its products, which obtain among and on the basis of the objects of natural science. The mental and the biological are dependent on the physical and cannot contradict the laws of the physical where those laws are applicable. But naturalism need not, indeed ought not, say that the objects of the human and biological sciences are solely physical or realizations of the physical, or even that the physical is causally closed. For if the physical is defined in terms of the objects, unique objects of physics, then the objects of other sciences do indeed cause changes in the physical. The orientation of the atoms of the marigold's petals depend on metabolic processes. The location of drosophilia's molecules depend on fixed action patterns. The molecular structure of bronze was caused by human historical agency. We can now see that while the objective, while objective relativism and emergence are very different kinds of theories, they have something in common. Both deny that the objects of inquiry are utterly determined by the most fundamental or the most comprehensive level of analysis. Richard Feynman asked which end of the continuum of nature, his continuum of nature, is nearer to God, microphysics or the ultimate ideals of beauty and hope? His answer was, quote, I do not think either end is nearer to God. To stand at the end, hoping out in that direction, is the complete understanding is a mistake. The great mass of workers in between, contact, connecting one step to another, are gradually understanding this tremendous world of interconnecting hierarchies. Now we can at last provide a set of more determinate concepts for analyzing nature, consistent with, but not derived from, the foregoing. And that's my point number five. Natural complexes can be understood as systems with their kinds and properties, which are A, constituted by structures, processes, and subaltern systems, B, of varying degrees of entification, and C, locatable in at least five emergent orders, the physical, material, biological, and the cultural. The first two points, A and B, say that among the, all the equally real discriminable complexes of nature, we may term what are usually con considered entity systems. This may sound Aristotelian, substituting systems for substances, but it departs from Aristotle in other respects. First, the parts and environments of a system are, are themselves systems. Second, systems have no ontological primacy. There is ontological parity between processes, hence events and states, structures, hence relations, and systems, hence their components. If there is no a priori reason to privilege entities or substances, there is also no a priori reason to privilege processes or events or structures or relations. Third, there are degrees of entification or being a system. The peak of entification is individuals like atoms, molecules, planets, rocks, organisms, and persons, which are all components undergoing processes, maintaining them in a structure. But in addition, there are ensembles like volumes of gas and liquid, clouds, swarms, and societies, which are components in soft structures undergoing processes. And lastly, the fields of the basic forces, which are space-time structures of a quantity undergoing processing processes, but lacking aggregative fermionic components. Now to the last slide. 
The last point C is that these systems, processes, structures, and their properties and kinds occur in at least five orders important enough for a philosopher to distinguish. The physical, material, biological, mental, and cultural. By physical, I mean the objects of the parts of physics called fundamental, the smallest systems studied by quantum field theory, the largest structures of general relativity and cosmology, and the processes of energy transformation governed by thermodynamics. From these emerge normal matter, the objects of chemistry, astrophysics, and the earth sciences. Then there is life, a set of activities characteristic of complex material organisms studied by the biological and ecological sciences and the macromolecules, societies, and ecosystems that come with them. Minds, as far as we can tell, are integrated sets of intentional activities performed by neurologically gifted animals. Culture, the manipulation of social meanings expressed in narrative, artifact, and ritual, at present seem characteristic only of homo sapiens. The nature and relations of these orders is contingent and open to endless inquiry. This is the picture woven by ordinal naturalism. This approach recasts a number of philosophical problems. Its response to mind-body dualism, largely abandoned in metaphysics, but still compelling in the philosophy of mind and ethics, is not to make mind or the physical the basis of the other, nor to posit dialectic, dialectical mediation between them, nor even to regard each as the function of an underlying reality. It is to demote mind and matter each to one kind of system, process, or structure in a more pluralistic ensemble. Neither mind, the physical, or their combination adequately explain all of their orders of nature, for example, life. Then there is this distinction between the realist and representationalist theories of perception, between so-called primary and mind-dependent secondary qualities. For ordinal naturalism, the difference between primary and secondary is not a difference between objectivity and subjectivity, but between the breadth of the domains in which the properties function. It accepts the realist view that normal perception directly captures its objects, but not that perception is non-representational or immediate. Perception is a biological and mental process which functions to represent. The integrity of the object as perceived is a state of that process. As to the so-called intermediaries between perception and world, there are as many or as few as you like since processes are indefinitely analyzable. When I eat an apple, the process of eating is mediated by my desires, hands, saliva, and enzymes, serially interacting with the apple's pulp, fructose, cells, molecules, etc. However many intermediaries there are, it is still the apple that I eat. This also applies to what some call tertiary qualities, that is values. Values can be as objective and relational as anything else. An intrinsic good means not a property that holds independent of all relations, since nothing holds independently of all relations, but rather what is objectively good to, a for, to or for a kind of system or systems process regardless of the judgments of particular agents. Such objectively relative values, as well as purposes and norms, are evident throughout the biological order. That the wood thrush travels south in order to avoid the winter is objectively true and does not depend on any purpose in the thrush's mind. That the acorn has food value for the deer, but not the coyote. That the bird is supposed to have two wings are objective. Objective value, objectively valuable substances circulate through ecosystems, as Holmes Ralston has argued. Complex animals also act teleologically, their behavior guided by minded motives, affects, and cognitions. Among these are we humans, and we are coming near the end. Among these are we humans. But homo sapiens are indeed remarkably distinct. 
Some think human norms cannot be the product of natural processes. Emergent naturalism allows us to say that while the good or norm of a system's activities depend on its parts and their processes, it is not reducible to them. Humans are social and cultural by nature. We are, in the words of Marjorie, Dream, Marjorie Green, naturally artificial, or as Valerius Geist puts it, condemned to art. Truth, moral goodness, righteousness, and aesthetic quality are emergent cultural norms which only obtain in the functioning of societies of linguistic, socially self-conscious learners. Strong arguments can be made that human life would be impossible without them, that they cannot be justified without reference to the natural needs, conditions, and endowments of our species, and yet are not reducible to the biological strata from which they arise. In conclusion, ordinal naturalism is described here as a fallible hypothesis, but a robust one. Its hierarchy of orders matches the apparent evolution of our universe. For it currently appears that the physical arose before the creation of atoms or normal matter, and much later in our cosmic locale came life, then animal mind, then cultural human beings. No assumption is made here that this evolution was necessary, linear, or guided. The list of orders is not final, and their character is open to endless investigation. Scientific positivism, logical analysis, phenomenology of experience, pragmatics of social action, and the semiotics of culture can all make contributions to this inquiry. Yet the gambit of ordinal naturalism is that wherever it leads, wherever those contributions lead, they will have to leverage themselves with robust knowledge of the emergent orders of nature. Thank you. I'm going to close that and open the chat. And there is Jessica Woman is here already. I'm eager. What can I say? <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, really, it's really interesting and I'm extremely sympathetic to it and I love thinking about it. And I love thinking about it even more because it got me to think harder about something DeCaro said yesterday that I wanted to take issue with. And that I think, I, that I wanna ask you about too. I'm not sure if this works, but I, I almost wonder if your ordinal naturalism has to contain an implicit sort of materialism at work because otherwise it seems compatible with a sort of naturalized Leibnizian idealism. So, and here's why. So I thought it was interesting when DeCaro talked about relationality as sort of fundamentally opposed to Leibniz because of course Leibniz, everything's a substance. But all the substances are essentially relations and they're relations of hierarchies of order. And so when, when you had your X, Y, and Z thing, it made me think more and more about monads, right? I mean, there, there's definitely limitations because monads have no windows, but you know, like the mind is the sufficient reason for the organization of the body and the monads of the body are sufficient reason for the organization of the cells and, you know, and all the other things. And then we go out. There, it definitely isn't a one-to-one -one thing, but where I guess I'm getting at is if the reason the physical is the most sort of general category in your ordinal naturalism, because everything else seems to sort of depend on that, you could sort of flip it and make perception the most fundamental because in experience, everything is perceived and you could, your definition of nature could almost be a kind of naturalized idealism unless we assume naturalism assumes a commitment to a kind of materialism or physicalism of some sort. I just wondered what you thought about that because that's what's been going on in my brain for 24 hours. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe if I answered it just in two parts. So uh, in terms of Leibniz's monads, I don't remember my Leibniz well enough to remember. The monads are that which constitute everything. So in a sense, they're simple in that you, you cannot analyze a monad into other components. Nevertheless, the monad internally is very complex in what it's doing. Okay. 
So uh, complexes and natural complexes in this view can't ever be simple. In other words, there is no bottom floor. Um, and from my perspective, even making the physical the bottom floor isn't, the physical is the bottom floor as far as we know. So, um, and then as to um, well, how it could be an idealism, right. I mean, I think, I think if you're going to be a naturalist, my, my own claim is objective relativism, that's compatible with idealism. Right. But once I claim that um, there's that it's a normal, it appears to be a nomological fact that there's certain orders of our world which are asymmetrically dependent on others, then that makes that impossible. That's the part I'm quibbling with because they're all everything that is physical that we know of as physical is dependent upon perception from an idealist point of view. Um, like matter is a confused idea, kind of. I, I'm I not sure I agree with I, the move, but that's the. I understand. Make. I understand. Now, the only way that an idealist can do that is you got to start with God as a perceiver. Um, uh, and there's no other way because you know, there's all sorts of stuff going on in the universe that we don't perceive. Somebody's got to be perceiving it, right? So if everything's a perception, from my point of view, right, from my naturalistic point of view, perception is a latecomer to the universe. Right. There's all sorts of other stuff you need before you can have it. Right. And I agree with it. I'm just, I'm just wondering if it entails, if, if that position entails a, a more like sort of implicit assumption that the natural sciences are right. And, and form the basis of our understanding well, if that's, that the physical if that's, is the most inclusive and then other things depend on the physical. Yeah, I'm well, I think, yeah. well anyway, I think yeah. in that sense. Okay. Um, cool. Wait, I have to read this. Okay. Robert Innes. The uh, the schema of the, of the emergent orders, I think, is absolutely, totally... Correct, but my question is, uh, what is the role of philosophy once we get to the the, the top emergent order? Namely, what uh, what work is there to be done? It seems to be it would be fundamentally phenomenological, or in what sense would 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 philosophy have any work to do beneath that level, other than distinguishing the the or the the where the orders are going to be cut? What I would say is, uh, and I I really believe this, and I'm not merely saying this as a spokesman for my society, uh, but um, of which I will be for at least a few more hours. Uh, but uh, in an era of specialization, nobody is trying to keep their eye on the most general ways in which the various orders of nature interact with each other except people in our profession. So what's left to do, it's not as if those orders are climbing a ladder to a top and then something great is attained or ends. It's, I, I don't mean that at all. I just mean that we have a nested, we have phenomena that are asymmetrically dependent on others. To understand them properly, you have to understand how they're, how they are partly composed of those, hence aspects of them are legitimately reductively explained, okay? But then other aspects are not. And um, there's, you know, there's nobody around in the sciences uh, pretty much uh, who is interested in doing the work of trying to even see how these might relate to each other. And of course, yeah, so. Yeah. You know, you met Marjorie Green. So you started Marjorie Green at the uh, beginning of your talk, or mentioned her at the beginning of your talk. But uh, as a matter of fact, um, uh, she was not really a great fan of of emergence in that sense because uh, she helped very much um, uh, Michael Polanyi in his great book on personal knowledge, which has a key chapter on emergence, which is basically the 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 schema that you give, and she tried to argue him out 
of including any account of emergence in his in his um, in in that in that great book. Uh-huh. Uh, but the schema that you give is almost identical with the schema that he worked out in uh, totally independently of of almost uh, the normal philosophical way right. of, of doing it. So I, it's a confirmation of your okay. of of the schema. Uh, the problem is what within these various orders, once we've distinguished them, what is the specifically further philosophical task? Is it a phenomenological task? Is it a semiotic task? Uh, of, uh, or of, um, of, of, of how does that work out? Well, I, I, I just I, I don't think of somehow. That let's take, for example, um, I think it makes very good sense to say that uh, mentality, intentionality, mind, consciousness too, arose among uh, various classes of animals, mostly vertebrates. Um, and that's that trying to figure out how and where and when, that is an enormous discussion. Trying to clarify just how humans are different from non humans, that's we will always be finding out ways in which uh, non-human animals can do things that we only thought we could do. Nevertheless, they're still, they're still not us. So in other words, every, all, everything about and all the, the constitution of all these spheres and their relations is open to all sorts of inquiry that's not just scientific, but logical, conceptual, which we do all the time, like in philosophy of biology, uh, and phenomenological concerns when would be particularly relevant when we get to the human order, which is cultural and semiotic concerns. So I don't know. I, I kind of, it, it, it's all up for grabs. But, but if, <laughs> if your main point is to accuse me uh, of stealing. I'm not accusing you, I'm praising you. If you just let the president finish. The, if uh, accusing... If you're accusing me of stealing from Polanyi, I, I take it as a great compliment. Um, uh, George Lucas. Thank you, Larry. Um, uh, this is quite a remarkable stereoscopic synoptic vision. Very impressive. Um, I think along the lines of the questions that Jessica and Robert just, just raised, there are elements you could emphasize that would answer some of their like for example, the perception uh, from afar that seems to entail idealism. Um, the necessity of that could be handled by by arguing that any complex not only is not simple, but enjoys or incorporates or experiences uh, asymmetric internal relatedness. That is a kind of primordial perceptivity. Um, Perception is merely a complicated form of that, you know, embodying of the other in self. So, mm-hmm. so that would, I think, take care of Jessica's comments. And for Robert and Polanyi, <laughs> well, I guess when I look at your vision, I wonder, okay, no one and no thing seems to be excluded. Um, everything has its place, and that includes lots of other forms of slightly defective metaphysical thinking or um, uh, privileged position metaphysical thinking. Uh, And uh, everything and everyone finds their place in this remarkable scale that you've composed. Is anyone left out? Is anyone offended? Is anything left out? Is anything offended? Is any kind of postulated entity like, for example, being simpliciter or God or, you know, whatever, um, necessarily excluded from discussion or relevance or authenticity in this view of metaphysical reason? I think two two very good questions. Uh, The first one right in in this view uh i see no evidence that whitehead was right so in other words the 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 ascription of i mean i i i 
I'm teaching me Whitehead. Well. I'm teaching Whitehead on Monday. Uh, I nobody nobody accomplished what Whitehead did. Nevertheless, so there's a Whitehead used the idea of emergence for some things. He knew the emergentists, uh, particularly Alexander. Um, uh, Conway Lloyd Morgan was probably was really the prime emergentist, but Alexander was very important. He was familiar with that. But what Whitehead does is to build prehension into every actual occasion, no matter how humble. And from an emergentist point of view, there's not really any need to do that, and it, it doesn't. I don't know what the evidence is for that. In other words. On an emergentist point of view, um, no form of intentionality arises at least until you get some kind of living creatures, and probably not until you get living creatures with with uh, neural systems. But in other words, you just whatever it is true. In other words, emergence resists the the strategy of trying to read into the history of the development of the universe properties that we see later and say there must have been prototypical versions of them earlier on. So emergence doesn't do that. Um, for the regard to the second question, I mean I don't I don't think I don't think that little drawing one thing about it you notice the 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 cosmic egg uh, drawing, it's right. it's uh, the line. The outside lines are dotted. Okay, this is a discrete description of various orders that we seem to have evidence for. I don't know that there are uh, there that there are no others. God isn't mentioned, um, and I don't mention any beings from which the physical could be constructed. Um, it's too big a picture to call it local, but let's just say here we've got some evidence that we're in here, and here are the various layers and uh, zones of reality in which we have our being. So, um, and there's no right. There's uh, so anybody who wishes to try to that that was to some extent. The, the my last claim, the last line of the paper was, I don't for a moment think that this is any kind of a final vision. I think this is an attempt to break up a traffic jam and to allow traffic to move. Um, and uh, but I think in the future, as we know more, not just scientists, but philosophers and others trying to figure out this thing that we have called existence on earth, that what, what's going to happen is each of these pieces is going to be understood in more complicated ways. Current theories are going to be recognized to be special cases of more complex theories, okay? And it even might be true that there are phenomena that are discovered that really can't fit into any of those five orders, okay? Huh. And that's fine with me. But the claim is, I think you'll need these to be able to make that argument. <laughs> right. That's it. Um, Tyler. You, you know what, Larry, my uh, question, I think, is very similar to George's, except uh, much less informed and, and uh, less artfully posed. But, you know, it's a question of like in your ordinary naturalism. Uh, it seems that the higher is the younger and that the lower True. is the older. And True. so one, you know, how if there is a God or theology, where would it fit? Uh, and so if there isn't, why not? But if there is, then it would seem to only be able to be a God that could finish things, but not a God that could start anything. Because, again, the older or the, the superior in the system seems to be the younger. And so we couldn't have a God that could start anything, but only finish something. Well, I don't, the, 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 the yeah, I, I mean, I would, I, that would be a Deschardins point of view. 
Um, I I wouldn't. I wouldn't try to decide what's real by what's superior or better right. or would be nice. Um, so uh, the if you if you wanted to think about God here, it you one could think of God as the ground of being from which the physical emerges, uh, and that somehow. I mean, if you think of whatever human existence or the kind of cultural intelligence that human beings have, which could, we don't know, be replicated and, and surpassed all over this universe, of which we know barely nothing, okay? Um, in our locale, humans have more complex things to do and say than the very complex things of other species on our planet. We don't know anything about what's going on elsewhere, okay? And I, uh, the picture, in other words, is not so much, and the, the diagram tries to show this, everything after the evolution of stars is a local matter. We, in our locale, there's a high degree of order, and life arose, we don't know how, and life evolved in amazing ways. Uh, I would, unlike Deschardins, I would be very uh, shy about saying something about human being is at the top of this somehow evolution of the universe. I wouldn't know what that is. I would just be happy that, you know, we got this far. <laughs> uh, it, Wes, is it Wes DeMarco next, I think? Yes. I'm muted. I was just get, saying such nice things about you, but now you, you didn't hear them, and I'm not going to repeat them. No, I, it's a <laughs> wonderful, uh, wonderful talk, and, and I was just grinning from ear to ear during most of it. I'm not going to ask the questions on the uh, in the chat, if that's okay, because I'd like to pick up on... Ask on whatever you want. Is, uh, question if I can hear myself because I'm hearing you from my computer I'm also hearing you from May's computer in the next room <laughs> there's uh -huh. a weird echo going on here so um it seems to me that that um um the later Wittgenstein offers resources that allow us to do very much the same thing uh you get something like ontological parity you get orders within orders and of course for him the, what's left for philosophy would be the grammatical investigation, according to which one sorts out the various kinds of meaning and the various kinds of orders in, in that sense. Now, the question is, um, is, is this, doesn't, doesn't your, your um, drawing on Buckler reduce similarly to, reduce is not the right word, but doesn't it become similarly a, just a kind of semantics that gives us a kind of of, uh, uh, of, of thought structure or linguistic structure or, or something else along those lines that that's, it's, it's allowing us to talk. I love the traffic jam metaphor. I thought that was that was great. But um, in, in essence, two parts sort of why not the later Wittgenstein? And secondly, um, isn't this more like the grammatical investigation of Wittgenstein and less like what we've come through the traditions in the plural, I use advisedly, to, uh, as metaphysics? Okay, so I would say, um, good question. Uh, the I think you could draw. Look, there are definite people have written about and and the comparisons between the later Wittgenstein and Buckler. Right. Um, so now a, a real difference is Buckler is a metaphysician. I mean, so Buckler is making claims about whatever can be discriminated at all. Um, and Wittgenstein is not, okay? Two, but then even if you could grant that you can kind of take a Wittgensteinian view and, uh, you know, Wittgenstein on the de dicto side talking about how we think and talk and Buckler on the de re side talking about what there is to talk about, even if you want to draw a comparison there, Wittgenstein, I will just say, in a 
perhaps unfair manner. Wittgenstein, and if Nancy Frankenberry is here, it's she, Wittgenstein and Rorty had the same problem, which is that they believed there's nothing philosophically interesting about the natural sciences. Nothing. Okay. Now that doesn't mean finding interesting things in the natural sciences doesn't mean you have to lay down and swallow them and, and never have another thought, but they really, and it's true of Wittgenstein. It was one of his brilliant at what he did, but it was one of the respects in which he, he, he was limited. So that you can't what you can't do is get any of the naturalism out of Wittgenstein, I think. Okay. Um, this is we have Nick. Wait, wait, wait. Nick, Nick Guardiano. Yes, thanks. I'll just read my question. It does follow up actually on the last one, which so it is, uh, would you say that ordinal relativism, this goes back to how you opened up your presentation. Would you say that ordinal relativism as a language for description, contra characterization of being, places your approach outside metaphysics as historically practiced by the ancients, medievals and moderns? And I'll just tack on kind of like a hidden critique there that's been on my mind, which I want you to ask Robert Corrington this question too, who also relies heavily on uh, Buckler's ordinal naturalism. And I was curious if um, he thought there is a nominalism at play here in using this uh, you know, language or semantics, but not wanting to commit to a characterization of being and also relying on this idea of just distinguishing anything and everything, no matter what it is. So um, yeah, go ahead. I look at it a little differently. I understand what you're saying. I I did I did in the paper refer to using ordinal uh, um, objective relativism along with fallibilism as a kind of language with which to then argue for uh, naturalism. But but it isn't just a semantics. Um, it's it's a set of it's a method you could say. It's it's a it's a set of claims about how to handle whatever we discriminate and what not to look for, um, and so and it was developed the objective relativists. I mean, it basically it it comes actually it comes out of the neutral monism that was formulated by Ernest Mach, by um, William James and Bertrand Russell who didn't like pragmatism, but he liked the neutral monism. And then I think what Cohen did was Cohen turned it into a kind of pluralism. And then it popped up in a whole bunch of different people between the 1920s and the 1940s. So uh, also I'm being critical of the objective relativists because they thought they were formulating a naturalist, an extremely broad pluralistic naturalism. OK, so I may paint them a little bit as if they're linguistic rather than but they're not. They're trying to describe the world. I mean, Nagel, if you read what Nagel says about it, uh, Nagel has this uh, essay from 1947 where he makes it clear he thinks this this and not pragmatism is America's greatest contribution to world thought. Um, this objective relativist point of view. So. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't know that this is hidden. I think it has something to do with the early 20th century explosion of realism, perceptual realism, logical realism, et cetera. And then people trying to deal with those problems that ar arose in the midst of that. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, Timothy Eastman. Uh, yes, it. Uh... So I really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, thank thank you, you so much. Uh, it, I, I concur very much with your critique of both uh, simplistic reductions to nothing but process or events, as well as uh, simplistic reductions to nothing but material. Uh, 
you provide a methodology for thinking about the multiple levels uh, in this framework of objective naturalism that I think is quite compatible with how uh, many working scientists just sort of take their worldview uh, in a way that I think mostly is not the kind of uh, reductionism to materialism that is often inferred, but really is more multi-level and mm. uh, very complex, as you uh, argue. So, it, uh, so I very much appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very kind of you. Alo Basso, I think, has a question. Yes, I came in with my obnoxious objection, and I'm sure I shocked everyone, but not you, with that um, old caps in the chat. So as a practicing neuroscientist, when you're yeah. rolling down the hill yeah. and you're vomiting and cursing, you know, right. integrative physiology is right. attempting right. to explain that phenomenon at all of the levels that you're describing from physical to cultural. Right right mm -hmm. up to what language you're cursing in and why you're cursing in that language, mm -hmm. right? So what are we then, we being people not included in your statement, you said only philosophers are thinking this way, right? So what are we doing wrong, right? What is the gap in the thinking of the integrative physiologist or the neuroscientist, right? Yeah. Which is not, uh, actually trying to understand these phenomena at the appropriate levels of analysis. We are actively trying to figure out what species should move between the level of biology to the level of mental and what species should be classified in culture versus not culture. This is a subject of this field, right? Right, right. So what is it that we're in our process or in our assumptions? Is it, as Dr. Eastman suggests, this you know, tendency to to go to simple reduction to materialism is that the well? Problem? I would say I would say you know, and present co present company is excluded. But the I would say that um, uh, they ought to read some more philosophy. Um, they, they, they really should. I mean, so the so here here's what I would say, and 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 we ought to listen to you more. That's the other side. So, just a couple of examples. Um, the whole problem of mental causation, right, is huge, and I think it's. But I think the I think the the scientists have a certain prejudice or guess about what it has to be like. It has to be like this, and the philosophers have rather outmoded ideas of causality. In other words, the the real problem in mental causation is. How could it be that a thought or a any mental state, which is, a, let's say, a semantic phenomenon, it's, it has to do with meanings. And it, it, if you're a naturalist, you say that can only be there because there's the, the particular um, organization of neuronal activity that subtends it. It's OK. The question is going to be, can that, can, 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 when A arises from B, can A turn around and make a difference to B? And I think it can. And I think that happens all over the natural world. So that would be an example. Another example would be, and we've talked about this before, which is, you know, the, the cognitive science people who, when they discuss free will, have the most bizarre notion of what it is in order to get rid of it. <laughs> you know, and if you, if you define free will as, oh, that would be the case where a person makes a choice or forms an intention that's utterly uncaused, okay? Well, if that were true, then there wouldn't be any free will, but it doesn't have to be true. <laughs> and so that's that's what I mean. So, I mean, I think we all, right. The hard thing is we all have to listen to each other, but we also, it doesn't do any good to just be, you know, sweet and nice and say, oh, gee, but but actually to to, to work hard and have disagreements and then, and then try to find solutions. Because I'm not saying that any of these, kinds of emergence are not mysterious. It just seems they're evident. That's my claim. They're there. Uh, somehow, in other words, in other words, 
somehow, somewhere, the right organic molecules in the right place in the right time wind up with a living cell. Now, we don't know how, but I think I, there's an overwhelming amount of evidence that that did happen. And so, anyway, I'm, I'm sorry if that didn't really help, but thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if we have, to, I mean, we're over time now. And uh, is that right? Yep. Thank you all for being here. And uh, the uh, uh, plenary on uh, Hans Jonas starts in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you much. Thank you.